to another Time Travel Tuesday, where we combine tingles and nostalgia, as decided by you. So, for this week's Time Travel Tuesday, I held an 80s-themed vote, where I asked everyone to vote for their favorite piece of 80s nostalgia. Now, normally I share with you guys the top five votes. I didn't have time to do that this week, but I can tell you the top two. So coming in at number two was The Breakfast Club, and at number one, winning with a landslide, was Back to the Future. So in honor of the Back to the Future films, I thought I would share with you my version of The Hoverboard. Now I stress that this is my version, because this is not the official hoverboard from the Back to the Future films. This was inspired by the hoverboard. Um, so to avoid any copyright infringement, this is not the hoverboard. This is a floating skateboard that I like to call the floaty board. So allow me to demonstrate. everything that I know about Back to the Future. Okay, now, before I share with you all of my Back to the Future knowledge, I want to let you know that this week there will be another themed vote. So, 80s kids, I want to know about your favorite 80s candy. So, cast your votes in the comments below for your favorite candy from the 80s. Okay, guys. Back to the Future is a 1985 sci-fi comedy that was written and directed by Robert Zemeckis, and it was also co-written by Bob Gale. It stars uh, Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly the main character. Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown. Leah Thompson as Lorraine, Marty's mom. And Crispin Glover as George, Marty's dad. I'll give you a brief synopsis of the plot. So, Marty McFly is a teenager. He's a high school student. Who has kind of a blah family. They're all just kind of dissatisfied with their lives, but aren't really doing anything to improve them. He is close friends with kind of a kooky scientist by the name of Dr. Emmett Brown, who is, uh, at the time of the first movie, just discovering how to travel through time. Marty accidentally travels through time, back to 1955, when his parents were in high school. Marty does some stuff to accidentally screw up the, the history, the timeline of things, so he has to find a way to make sure that his parents uh, meet and fall in love uh, so that 
he won't cease to exist. And he also has to try and get back to 1985. Where he's from. Or when he's from. He does all this with the help of Doc Brown. So, Bob Gale, uh, who's one of the writers, actually came up with the idea for Back to the Future after going through his attic, or his dad's attic, maybe, and he found his dad's high school yearbook. And he, I think he and Robert Zemeckis were just talking, and he was, he just kind of wondered out loud if he would have been friends with his dad in high school. Thus, the idea was born. <laughs> so, uh, a man called Alan Silvestri did the score for the movie. Huey Lewis and the News wrote a couple of songs for the movie. And I think that was at Alan Silvestri's request. It was his idea to have them do the songs. But um, what's interesting is that Alan Silvestri had done... Oh, I forgot to tell you something. Steven Spielberg is the executive producer. Alan Silvestri had done the score for Romancing the Stone, uh, which was another film that Zemeckis had just, had just done. And Steven Spielberg, when Zemeckis wanted to bring um, Alan Silvestri on to do the score, Steven Spielberg said that he wasn't a very big fan of the score of Romancing the Stone. He didn't really like Alan Silvestri's work on that. But during a, a session, I guess, where they were listening to test scores for Back to the Future, Steven Spielberg heard a, a, like a bit of music that he really liked, and he said, that's what we need for Back to the Future. And it turns out what he had heard was uh, composed by Alan Silvestri. So they went with him for the film. I thought that was a funny story. And the film did extremely well. number one for 11 weeks and just stayed there. So, there was a very kind of unique, complex casting situation with this film. A lot of diehard fans probably already know about this. It's definitely worth mentioning because it's kind of funny. So Michael J. Fox, who is uh, Marty McFly, he was the actor that they wanted all along. But he was very involved in sh his work with the TV show Family Time. Time 
one of his co-stars on Family Ties, um, Meredith Baxter, I believe, was uh, pregnant, so she wasn't working as much. So, Michael J. Fox uh, had to kind of work more because of that. Pick up some of the slack. And the producer of the show would not allow him uh, to go work on Back to the Future, even though they wanted him to. So they cast uh, an actor named Eric Stoltz instead. And for the part of Jennifer, who is Marty McFly's girlfriend, they wanted the actress Claudia Wells, uh, but she wasn't available either. So for Jennifer, they went with um, uh, Melora Hardin, who some of you may know as uh, Jan on the show The Office, the American one. for about a month with Eric Stoltz and Melora Hardin as Marty and Jennifer. And there are even some promo photos still out there for the movie uh, with those two in it. But after about a month, the uh, director Robert Zemeckis and everybody, I guess, realized that Eric Stoltz is not quite the man for the job. And apparently even Eric Stoltz felt that way. He, he felt that he wasn't, he wasn't right for the party there. Um, probably wasn't enjoying it very much. They said that he was playing Marty too serious and too dramatic. And there wasn't enough humor. So, they pretty much fired him. And by this time, uh, Meredith Baxter was back to work. And so they went to the producer of Family Ties and worked out. They were finally able to work something out to where Michael J. Fox could come and play Marty. But the Family Ties You can go work on this film, but the TV show comes first, so if there's ever a scheduling conflict of any kind, then we win. So, Michael J. Fox went to work on Back to the Future as Marty McFly. Not a tall man. So, once he started working and they began shooting scenes with him and uh, Melora Hardin, they realized that she was quite a bit taller than he was. And they didn't want that. They didn't want Marty's girlfriend to be about a whole lot taller. So they kicked her off. <laughs> and by that time, Claudia Wells was available. reshot pretty much everything with two whole new actors and it added about three million dollars to their budget which was I believe about 14 million or so added about three million dollars to reshoot everything with the new actors and Michael J. Fox since he was so, um, so committed to both projects, both um, the film and Family Ties. He was very overworked. He got 
very little sleep during this time because he would, during the week, he would work on family ties from 9 a.m. to 6.30 in the evening and then he would pretty much go straight to work on Back to the Future which would usually run into the wee hours of the morning to 2.30 in the morning sometimes even later than that and because of his commitment to family ties the only time he could shoot during the day was on the weekends so he spent his whole weekends shooting back to the future and he basically got no time off He must have been pretty tired. So there was this uh, executive at Universal named oh, Sydney. Scheinberg, I think. Scheinberg. And he was responsible for some changes that were made to the film. For instance, Lorraine, uh, Marty's mother, that character was originally named Meg, but they changed her name to Lorraine after um, Sidney Scheinberg's wife, Lorraine. One of the most interesting changes that he tried to make happen was to change the title of the film from Back to the Future to Spaceman from Pluto. And the horrified, appalled feeling that you're experiencing right now about that title, it's exactly what Robert Zemeckis felt when Sidney Scheinberg sent out that memo. So he pretty much called up Steven Spielberg and said, help me, what do I do? This cannot be the name of my film. So Steven Spielberg, being the very brilliant man that he is, he sent a memo Sidney Scheinberg saying basically um, what a great joke everyone thought that everyone got a real kick out of that joke memo you just sent and Sidney Scheinberg I guess was too embarrassed to admit that it wasn't a joke that really was what he thought the name ought to be he was so embarrassed that he dropped it and it was never mentioned again and they got to keep the title as it was <laughs> thank god so the machine that Marty and Doc travel in is in the form of a DeLorean which is a car originally the time machine was going to be a refrigerator They changed that for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which was that Robert Zemeckis was afraid that after kids saw the movie, they would try and climb into their refrigerators and they might lock themselves in. And so 
There's a character in the first film, in the second film, uh, named uh, Biff Tannen. And Biff is just kind of a big bully. He's actually a pretty horrible person. He does some pretty messed up stuff in the first movie. He's probably a step or two above just a bully. He's a pretty terrible person. But, uh, that character, uh, supposedly based on this executive that, uh, that they met, that, um, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale met. His name was uh, Ned Tannen, and this nasty character Biff was sort of based on him and named for him because uh, he had had some kind of like really aggressive, rude uh, behavior towards Robert Zemeckis. someone in real life that they didn't like. So, uh, I mentioned that Huey Lewis and the News did a couple songs for the film. They did uh, Power of Love and Back in Time. What you might not know is that Huey Lewis is in the film. There's a scene where Marty is auditioning with his band to play at uh, school dance, maybe, or Battle of the Bands, I'm not sure. I can't remember. But he's, uh, he's doing an audition. And there's a panel of four judges who all kind of look sort of old and stuffy. Marty's playing some loud rock music. I believe he's actually playing Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the News. But anyway, there's a panel of four judges, and one of the judges stands up and says, uh, says, uh, I'm sorry, but you're just too darn loud. And that judge was Huey Lewis. A lot of you hardcore fans, you maybe already knew that. That's okay. So in a previous Time Travel Tuesday, I told you guys all about the movie Gremlins. And if you've ever seen Gremlins, and you've seen Back to the Future, then the set for the main street of the town for each of those movies will look very familiar because it's the same set. And I don't know if it's been used in anything else, but it was used for both of those movies. Scene in Back to the 
future. The first one. Where? Marty. Well, I won't mention too much about it. I don't like to give away any details, but he... He plays a cassette tape that's labeled Edward Van Halen. Place the tape and it's loud. Rock music, obviously. The reason the cassette tape says Edward Van Halen is that they wanted to use the band Van Halen and they wanted to use a cassette tape that said Van Halen. But Van Halen, the band, would not allow the use of their name for that scene. However, Eddie Van Halen, the man, did allow his name. And the song that's playing on that cassette tape is um, an untitled piece of music that Eddie Van Halen wrote just for, just for the movie and performed. This is a little easter egg of the movie that, again, most of you fans probably are already familiar with. But if you maybe haven't seen the movie 15,000 times, then this might be news to you. So, the mall in Back to the Future 1. Marty meets Doc Brown and where they or where he ultimately accidentally time travels in the beginning of the movie the mall is called Twin Pines Mall when Marty travels back in time he uh, encounters the man who basically owns the town, Mr. Peabody, and he uh, likes to grow pine trees. Marty accidentally runs over one of his pine trees when he's driving away um, and knocks it down. When, towards the end of the film, when Marty returns to 1985, The next time we see the mall, it's not called Twin Pines Mall anymore. It's called Lone Pine Mall. That's not something that's that's especially pointed out. It's just there. Like a little Easter egg. I guess that's considered an easter egg. It's more just a very clever piece of continuity. But I like it. I think it's funny. Uh, this is an easter egg in Back to the Future 2 when Marty visits uh, 2015 where he first comes across the hoverboard. There's a movie theater called The Holoplex that's playing. You can see it in the background. And uh, it's playing Jaws 19, which is sort of a joke on movies that make too many sequels. But it's supposed to be directed by Max. And that's what it says on the sign. It says Max Spielberg. Max is the actual son of Steven Spielberg in real life. Uh, 
another little easter egg in the second film there's an 80s nostalgia cafe um, and in the cafe they're playing TV shows, old TV shows from the 80s that were popular in the 80s one of the shows they're playing is Family Ties which had Michael J. Fox and another one they're playing is the show Taxi which uh, was the show that Christopher Lloyd I believe started on and that's just sort of playing in the background of the film so if you've never noticed that keep an eye out for it the third film, Back to the Future Part 3. Uh, Doc Brown has um, a love interest. Or is it Doc Brown? Christopher Lloyd has a love interest. Uh, he uh, shares a kiss with her on screen. Is the first and only on screen kiss that Christopher Lloyd has ever done in his entire acting career. I believe to this day. in the third film, the band ZZ Top uh, is in the movie. So, while they were filming that movie at some point, uh, a camera that was being used uh, got broken. So while everyone was just kind of hanging around, waiting for the camera to be repaired, Michael J. Fox asked if ZZ Top would play a song. And they did. And then people kept requesting more and more songs. And then several hours went by and someone thought to ask Robert Zemeckis if the camera was fixed yet. And he said, uh, he said that the camera had been fixed for a long time. The camera had been fixed for, for hours, but he didn't want to shut down the sort of impromptu party that had happened. I don't know if that's really trivia or an interesting fact, but I thought it was kind of a first movie, there's when Marty first gets to 1955, he meets up with Doc Brown. Doc Brown ask, asks who the president of the United States is in 1985. And Marty tells him it's Ronald Reagan. And Doc Brown doesn't believe him. He thinks that's crazy. Because at this point, in history, Ronald Reagan was still an actor. So he sort of scoffs at it. Now, at that... For that part of the, of the script, they had to send the script. Well, they, I'm not sure that they had to, but they did. They sent the script to the White House to sort of get it approved. Because they didn't want to offend the president. What actually happened was that Ronald Reagan became a really, really big fan of Back to the Future. Um, 
when he saw the movie for the first time and he <laughs> saw the part where uh, Doc Brown says the line about Ronald Reagan. He liked it so much and got such a kick out of it that he had them rewind, rewind the tape or rewind the reel and <laughs> so he could watch it over again because he thought it was so funny. And then, uh, in his State of the Union address in 1986, I think, he actually quoted the movie. He quoted the line, Doc Brown's line at the end of the movie, where we're going, we don't need roads. He was even offered a part in I think the second movie, maybe the third one, but he was off for a part. And he really wanted to do it, because he loves Back to the Future. <laughs> uh, but he couldn't for some reason. He was, I think he was pretty disappointed about it. And, um, for any Stanley Kubrick fans out there, little uh, nod to Stanley Kubrick in the first film. Uh, so in Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, there is, um, I'm not sure exactly what it is, it's some kind of, uh, like a piece of radio equipment of some kind, I think, that's called the CRM-114, and that's just what it's called. Clockwork Orange, which is also a Kubrick film, there is something called Serum 114, which is sort of like, see, the first one was CRM, and then this is Serum 114. They sound alike, whatever. Anyway, so this is just something that appears in Stanley Kubrick films a lot, for some reason. I'm actually not sure what the significance of it is to Kubrick. Or if there is significance. But anyway, in Back to the Future, in the very beginning, the big giant amplifier in Doc's laboratory that Marty hooks his guitar up to is labeled CRM-114. And Steven Spielberg is a very big fan of Stanley Kubrick might actually even be friends with him. So there's something you might not have known. you have enjoyed this time travel Tuesday and you've learned a lot about Back to the Future. If you have not seen Back to the Future, you really must watch it. your density. And don't forget to cast your votes for next week's Time Travel Tuesday topic in the comments below. For next week's I want you to tell me or 
going to do another 80s themed vote this week. So I want you to tell me your favorite 80s candy. So all you 80s kids out there, tell me what your favorite candy was growing up. seeing you again very soon. But until then, sweet dreams.